I want us to go to Matthew chapter 13. I just do want to give a brief thanks to all of you who've loved us this year and will continue to love my daughter as she's here. We thank you for that. When we were preparing to come back to America, I was asking the Lord what he would have me do when I would go to a church and speak. And he said, I just want you to start in the book of Matthew and work the way through. So why are we here tonight? Because God wanted us to be here. So much so that my last speaking engagement that I had already prepared initial thoughts on this passage, my car blew up and never worked again. And we were not able to go because God wanted you to hear this tonight. So in eternity past, your God, the God of heaven and earth, who is, who was, who is to come, ordained that you would be here and that I would be here, and that this would be the passage that we hear from tonight. So I want you to consider that. By the way, God is always speaking. That's why Christ said, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. So we're going to just start off on the very first verse, <clears throat> Matthew chapter 13 and verse 54. This is a story in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ, and it says, And when he was come into his own country, he taught them in their synagogue, insomuch that they were astonished and said, Whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Hmm. So let's look at the beginning of that verse. And when he was come into his own country and taught them in their synagogue, so Christ has been in Capernaum. Don't worry, we'll pray in just a moment. He has been going out and preaching the gospel. He's been teaching in the synagogues, as the Bible lets us know. He has begun to call disciples. And on this day, God himself goes back in human flesh to his hometown. He grew up here. This was the place when he is roughly two or three years of age that he's brought back to. His father is from there. Most likely his mother is from there. And he goes to the synagogue on this Sabbath, on this Saturday, and he begins to teach them. And we're going to see their response. But before we do, let's pray. Now, as I pray, I'm going to ask you to pray. I'm going to ask you to speak to God Almighty and ask you to have ears to hear. Can we do this? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that when we are weak, you are strong. I thank you that your word is eternal. And that truth is alive. Now, Holy Spirit of God, I pray that you might take the double-edged sword of your word and may you divide asunder the thoughts and intents of our heart, our soul, and our spirit and show to us who we are. Hold our life in our hands and show it before us. You know each person. You know just what they need and what needs to be heard. But I also know that you are gentle. And you will not force us to hear, though you will draw us. Holy Spirit of God, I ask that we might yield our hearts and our will to you. And that you will plant the very seed of truth that we need. And may we water it with our attention. May we fertilize it with our obedience. 
And may you be glorified for all that you do. We pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen. In this verse, the Lord Jesus Christ, as I said, is there. He comes into the synagogue. Now, a synagogue is a very interesting situation. It's something that we're slightly removed from in our New Testament church era. Not in spirit, but in actions. A man would come, he would be, and they would have multiple teachers in a synagogue. They would come, and someone generally would open up the scroll of the Old Testament. They would give it to the man who would speak. He would stand up. He would open the scroll. He would read the passage. Um, it was written in Hebrew. Most people didn't understand Hebrew. I, I'm in a church that has multiple languages. We have about 14 languages in every single Sunday, so we have two main languages that we use in our services. And there would be times that they would actually have to translate into the vernacular, into Aramaic, into the normal tongue, what would be said in the Hebrew, but they would read off the scriptures and then, believe it or not, as pastor, I think he even intimated this recently, the speaker would sit down. And many times the people would stand. And then he would begin to speak, and they would begin to interact. And at times he'd even ask them forth questions, and they would respond. But Christ is here in this passage. He's in the synagogue in his hometown. And it says in verse 54, let's look at it again. And when he was come into his own country, he taught them in their synagogues. Insomuch that they were astonished. Hmm. That's a very interesting word. Um, we have a habit in our modern world, by the way, because it's an advertising world that everything is fabulous. How many know that? Everything's wonderful. Everything's beautiful. Words mean nothing in our modern day except to convince you of something. Right? Please, the Bible is not advertising. It is the word of God. And so when God speaks and he uses a word, it's for a very particular reason. God never over speaks. He never under speaks. He chooses just the right word. So I would like you to do something. Hold up your little white card if you have it, okay? I'm going to ask you to use it. If you don't have a pen, they can hand you out pens because we have this too. Um, I'd like you to do something for me. I would like you to write down the definition in your own words of the word astonished. Think about it for a moment. They were astonished. What does that word mean? Hmm. Don't worry, the Holy Spirit is not afraid of silence. He's not. So he comes into the synagogue, he stands forth, he begins where he sits, and he begins to teach, and as they're listening, they're astonished. So I'm curious, what did you write? By the way, many times when you're in scripture, one of the most dangerous things you can do is assume you know what something means. If you don't know, look it up. By the way, and when you think you know, and it's an important word, still look it up. Because you might be surprised that you're wrong. I was looking into this word and I was told that it means this, that they were amazed. They were struck out of their senses. They were shocked because they witnessed what was incredible. So can you imagine? So here's Christ, he's grown up in this town, he's sitting there, he's declaring the word of God, and as they're listening, they're just, the more they listen, what? Huh? And they start whispering and talking. Now, in the synagogue, it was very acceptable for people to talk with each other, because they were speaking about what was being said. Even with Christ, we see that, we see people interacting and discussing, and him even asking questions. Hmm. 
So they were astonished. And when he was come into his own country, he taught them in the synagogue in so much that they were astonished. So I have a question for you. Why were they astonished? I want you to consider it. Why were they astonished? Was it his voice? Wow, this man. I mean, he almost has as nice a voice as Brother Dalton. What was so amazing that it struck them dumb? What? I want you to think about it. Why were they astonished? The things that amaze us tell us a lot about ourselves if we will take time to think them over. They can tell us what we don't expect or what we appreciate so much it has the power to capture our attention. Have you ever been astonished? Wow, that is just an amazing sunset. Oh, I Wow, that's beautiful. There are times when you're paying such close attention to something that it does really overwhelm you. But how many of you know that most often that is not the case? Or it can be that we just didn't expect, well, I didn't see that coming. I want us to listen to the rest of this verse and see if they are astonished because of low expectations or deep appreciation. Are they astonished because they have low expectations or deep appreciation? Let's see what the Bible says. And when he was come into his own country, he taught them in their synagogues in so much that they were astonished and said, they're speaking to one another now. They're interacting with each other and they're looking at each other and they begin to murmur. Can you imagine? Maybe it's even rising now and there's talking and there's a little bit going on and they ask, whence hath this man this wisdom and these mighty works? Where did this come from? I wish I could take the time, and that I, at this point I do not believe the Lord is leading me to do this, but to explain to you what even they're talking about when they talk about the wisdom. There's a lot there. And the mighty works. They've heard stories. They've heard what's been happening in Capernaum. They've heard what's happening in other places. And now they come and they hear him speak. As far as we know, there's no miracle that happens in this synagogue on this day. So the mighty works that they're talking about is other things that they've heard of. Hmm. So let us consider what they say next. And his sisters, are they not, excuse me, verse 55, this is the carpenter's son. Is not his mother called Mary and his brother James and Joseph and Simon and Judas and his sisters, are they not with us? That's is interesting. Let us consider why they brought up Christ's family. I want you to take a moment on your card. By the way, we're going to do a lot of writing on it, so if you write really big, you're going to have a problem. So write, but just don't fill it all up with one word. I would like you to write on that card. I want you to consider why did they bring up his family? Write your thoughts. Why? Hmm. I'm going to ask you to be brave, I would like someone, if you would be willing to raise your hand, can you tell me your thoughts? Would you be willing to share it with someone? Why do you think they brought up, yes sir? 
Okay, he's from a low stock. A carpenter? He's not from a rabbinically respected family. He's not from someone who's considered to be uh, theologically amazing. Anybody else? Hey, you don't normally get to talk in church. This is your chance. Yes, sir. We're next door. They were normal. By the way, they knew them so well they could call them by name. We said they didn't mention the sisters. Unfortunately, in Bible times, generally women were considered of such low importance they didn't mention them by name. Who Christ was related to and who he had connection with in their minds greatly influenced their expectation of what he would or could do. This is just Joseph's son. He's just a guy we've known his whole life. And we knew actually when Mary was expecting and when they came back with this baby and we've known them. I want you to consider this question. How does others' opinions of us, their interactions with us, and their knowledge of us affect their expectations of Christ? How do other people's opinions of us, their interactions with us, their knowledge of us affect their expectations of Christ. No man is an island unto himself, a famous man once said. Neither is your Jesus. He needs no man. But who you are when we claim to be related to him, makes a difference. Let's go on to 56. And his sisters, are they not all with us? So it lets us know they're in the room. They're in the synagogue. They're sitting there. By this time, many people believe that Joseph is dead. Maybe not yet. But a stepfather, his mother, his brothers, his sisters, they're sitting in this room. Is our presence a help or a hindrance to Christ's purposes? I don't know. Was, we don't know all of the condition of Jesus Christ's family. It seems like they're not quite all understanding this. They are following the Lord. They move with him to Capernaum. We see some interactions, but it doesn't seem quite as much as if the, his brothers became disciples right away. Were they just as skeptical? Were they just as confused? Is our presence a help or a hindrance to Christ's purposes? And notice how the, let's put the words in their mouth. And whence then hath this man all these things? That's what it says in verse 56. Can you put that in your own words? Where did that come from? What? If this is his family, have you ever been, I hate to say that, have you ever been with some people and you wondered where they got their looks from? (laughs) And you meet their parents and you're like, oh, I get it. But then sometimes you meet their parents and you're like, wow. Sometimes two wrongs make a right. How many of you know? No, really. I will not interpret anything to your laughter. Maybe you and your wife know, but 
Where does this come from? Let us consider and take a note that these people are astonished not because of deep appreciation, but because of low expectations. So, you didn't know who was going to be here tonight. Some of you. What was your expectation? There are some of you who would find it extra hard to miss if you thought certain people were coming. Why? Because of your expectations. But some of you, if you heard someone would come, you would come to church because you do your duty, right? But what would you expect? They had God himself. God himself came in the flesh, the perfect wisdom, he spoke with them. And so let's see what happens in verse 57. And they were offended. That is a really interesting word. I want you to take another moment. Take that word offended. I want you to write down what you think the definition is. They were offended. They were offended. Hmm. How many of you have ever heard the word scandalized? How many of you have read that word before? You know that word. Interestingly enough, I was told when I was doing some study that the Greek word here is actually literally where we get the word scandalized. It's just a transliteration of that word. And it means that to, they, are to, they were stumbling, they were tripping up because of displeasure or disbelief. So they come, they hear wisdom and truth. They're sitting here hearing this presented. God himself speaking to them. And they start to talk with each other. And they're upset because they're like, look. Who is this? Where did this come from? Why is this man giving us wisdom? Now, I can imagine coming to church and being disappointed when you were given nothing. Spiritual chaff. But they were given wisdom and they were offended. He's opening up the wisdom of the world. He's speaking to them like no man. There were times that people would listen to him, the soldiers of Herod, and when he would be done, they were supposed to arrest him, and they would walk back, and they said, why didn't you arrest him? They said, no man ever spake like this man. And they're offended. So why are they offended? What does this show us about them? I want you to write down on your piece of paper quickly your thoughts. Just try to think of something in Scripture or think of something you know as truth, more than even opinion, that might guide us. What can we know about these people because they're offended? I wonder what it looked like. Maybe they crossed their arms. Maybe they began to murmur with each other. Maybe they frowned. But maybe they just closed their ears. Who is this? Why does he get to speak this to us? 
I thought of this verse in Psalm 119, 165. It says, great peace have they that love thy law and nothing shall offend them. That's truth. When we love God's law, peace reigns in our heart. And even when someone does something unexpected or unacceptable or even in reality something you really don't like, the first response is not offense. I didn't say agreement either. I'm not telling you that when you love God's law that you will agree with everyone, but being offended and being in disagreement are two very different things. So if I look at God's word and it says that they were offended and the Bible tells me that if I love God's law, nothing shall offend me, then they cannot love God's law. Loving God's law Offense is our litmus test. When you're offended, the test tells you you're not loving God's law. So, how does love develop between two people? How does love develop? I want you to think back, some of you in here, when you first were falling in love. How does, love, how does love grow between you and your children? How does love grow between two friends? How does love grow in a marriage? By the way, it is something that is active. Love is never something that is just left. It has to grow or die. So how does love develop between two people? I mean, how does it work? By the way, I live in a society where there are lots of people who don't even know what love is. They live in homes with people. They have parents. And in fact, they go to funerals and they weep and cry and fake to cry simply because that's what's expected at a funeral. But they don't have any emotional attachment to that person because they don't have love. This is what I wrote. Love, it it develops by seeking continual interaction and attention that leads to deeper relationship and commitment to the thing, the idea, or the person. So I believe that love is developed. Now, I understand Mr. Swain is a wonderful definition of love, and that's exactly right. But we're talking about how is this developed? It's seeking. I'm developing it by seeking to interact continually with something. That, and that interaction leads to a deeper relationship, a deeper growing, a commitment, a communication. Hmm. By the way, that's how love grows with God's word. It's just as alive. The Bible is not passive, it is alive. And we cannot just respond to it like we would. It is not information. It is a person. The word. It is alive. It must be interacted with. Hmm. So they don't love God's law. So then we see something very interesting, and Christ does something I can very much relate to. He proverbs them. Now, Brother Abraham will know exactly what I'm talking about. In Africa, we do this all the time. I believe they do it in Asia. It's a form of communication that has been lost in our Western civilization. We say that when we want to say something, they're like, just put it on the line, man. Just speak straight. By the way, that's not biblical language always. Speaking straight isn't always God's will. Now, wait, 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 wait. Somebody, whoa, whoa, Brother John, stop and listen to what I said. Truth handed by God 
is always straight. But the servant of God must be gentle. That's God's word. So Christ does something interesting. He proverbs them. And what proverbing does is is speaking truth in such a way that he's speaking idea to you, but that idea is not just, here you go, accept it or reject it. That's not the only thing you do with a proverb. Because you have a part as a listener. I want you to imagine a key in a lock. Can you put your hands up? Everybody will see if you're awake. All right, put your hands No, seriously, put your hands up. I want you to imagine you have a, a lock in one hand and a key in another. How does it work? You got to put them together. Now, some of you know what it's like to lose the key, right? A proverb is a key and lock method of speaking. It guides itself. It can truly have no false interpretation, but it is not just that I say it and you hear it and nod your head. When I speak a proverb, literally I'm saying something to you, and then you have to, by comparison or contrast, you have to put them together. You have to think upon it to understand it. And when it happens, the lock opens up, pop, and you get the truth. But only if you want it. God is gentle, and he will not force you to take truth. So he proverbs these men, and this is what he says. It's very amazing. He says, a prophet, but Jesus said unto them, a prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. Hmm. So anybody want to raise your hand and tell me what you think that means? How many of you grew up, by the way, and your parents would proverb you every once in a while, you know? My dad used to say something all the time growing up. If you don't want someone to get your goat, don't tie it out in the yard. <laughs> How many of you heard the old expression, little pitchers have big ears? We used to do this more. Anyone, what do you think this means? Anyone have an idea? Should I ask pastor? I'll ask the missionary. Rodney, what do you, you live in Asia. What do you think this means? A prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and in his own house. Any thoughts? They have low expectations. Did you read my sermon? Okay. Please, I want you to raise your hand if you've ever heard the statement or proverb, familiarity breeds contempt. Raise your hand if you've heard that. Familiarity breeds contempt. So what's that mean? By the way, if someone speaks to you and you don't actually listen to what they're saying, it's really not going to help you. You know, I would think we would generally say it this way, being around someone has a way of making us appreciate them less. I know, that's true. Basically, he's saying, look, a prophet has honor. He will be honored, he will be respected, but not in his own country, not in his own house. See, these people grew up around Jesus. They were familiar with him. Familiarity breeds contempt. Now, if that was true all the time, as we take it to mean, that would mean all of you would hate your spouse. But some of you don't. In fact, some of you, all these years, you love each other more. Not less. Now look, some of you, it is true. You do know your spouse better, and in fact, if you would be honest, you do have contempt. Some of you, that's true of your children. Some of you, that's true of this church. So let us say this, familiarity breeds contempt, but relationship builds intimacy. 
Familiarity breeds contempt. It is true. But relationship builds intimacy. So I want you to take a moment on your piece of paper and I want you to compare the difference between familiarity and relationship. Just take a moment, just a couple seconds. What is the difference between familiarity and relationship? I want you to think of a person that you are just familiar with and a person you have a relationship with. What's the difference? One, maybe you know their name. You might know their phone number. You might know a little bit about them. You know just enough to interact with them, to know some of their likes and dislikes. but what's a relationship? These people knew a lot about Jesus. They had been around him all their lives and they were familiar with him, but they did not have a relationship with him. I want you to imagine they grew up their whole life with Jesus. They were in the village. They saw him. They knew the family. They knew all about him. But they didn't know him. Do we have a relationship with Jesus Christ or would he say we only are familiar with him? And if so, how does it change? You can sit in this church your whole life. You can open that Bible every single day. You can do a ministry. You can be a speaker in a Sunday school class. You can be a pastor in this church. And only be familiar with Jesus. 58, I'm almost done. And he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. You know what? Low expectations is the enemy of hope. And my Bible tells me that this faith is the substance of things hoped for. You know why they could do nothing? They had no faith. Because they had no hope. And they had no hope because they had low expectations. I want to share with you very quickly a personal testimony. Last furlough, I was a believer, but not a disciple. I was a reader of God's word daily, but not a lover of God's word. but it's changed. How does it happen that we move from being familiar with Jesus to having a relationship with him? Number one, a change in understanding of my purpose in my daily interaction with the word of God. Your Bible is not a school book. It is not a how-to manual. It is not a place to get information. It is not a place to get facts. It is not a duty to be read. It is good to read. But if you just read, it's like sitting in a room with someone and never talking to them. On my last furlough, I began to meditate, not just read. 
I moved from familiar information to a relationship of understanding. Basically, to make this very quick, I began to open God's word, not so much concerned about getting it done as seeking to have a relationship with what it said. What's it mean? Who is this God in these pages? I would read. And now what I'll do is I'll read God's word and I'll, start, I'll read it through once and then I sit down and I say, okay, God, and I'll say back to try to pay attention. By the way, it's really hard to have a relationship with someone you're not paying attention to. And so I would read it and then I would say it back to myself and then I begin to think and ask myself, what is it saying? What does it mean? Do I understand? What does that word mean? What does that mean? What does that tell me about God? And I found him. I really found God in the pages of his word. He is alive. I cannot make you taste what I have tasted. I cannot give you what I have. But oh, I hope I might stir a hunger for you to find it for yourself. And I began to sit at the feet of Jesus Christ as a disciple through Scripture. I don't get to sit with Jesus alive, but I can sit at his word. Amen. What did he do? How did he act? When he taught, what did he do? When he preached, what did he do? When he interacted with people, how did he question? How did he look? How does he think? And that bled over into God. Who is God? No, don't ask yourself, what should I do about it? Yes, that's good. That's a question to come. But that's not the first question. The first question is, what does it tell me about God? You know, because if you don't know who he is, you won't know what to do for him. As the relationship grows, so will your obedience. I'm finished. But I'm curious. If Christ was the one standing here tonight, would you be offended? Do you have familiarity with God? Or do you, you yourself, truly have a relationship with God Almighty? By the way, it's really hard to have a relationship with someone who you only talk to every once in a while. 